if you'd like to. If you come to the church at five, you will, after about 35 minutes of watching the video, you'll have some uh, group sessions, all six feet apart with masks and everything. And, uh, and that's very interesting too, but I just want to mention that. Okay, we're uh, finishing up uh, the book of Colossians, or the letter of Colossians. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians uh, in Colossae. Now, the main, main focal passage was in this study has been Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, where he wrote, For in Christ, and we are all in Christ, and Christ is in us. That's, the, that's a major, that's a major um, point Paul makes in almost all of his letters. Christ in us, the hope of glory. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. All of God was in Christ. And you, you have been given fullness in Christ. We have been given the fullness of being in Christ. In other words, as God entered into Christ, as God lived in Christ every day, as he, as he was uh, word made flesh, in other words, uh, everything Jesus did, everything he said, all of his actions were done out of being full of God. And he was always seeking to do the Father's will. So, uh, and he's saying, Paul is saying here, this same spirit in Christ, God's spirit, can live in us when we give him permission, when we allow him to come in. I don't know about you, but there are times when God's fullness is all over me, and there are times when there's, he's nowhere to be found. Anybody else like that out there? We just find ourselves saying and doing things, thinking things that are far from the heart of God. Well, that's the constant challenge of allowing God's Holy Spirit to continue to fill us and guide us in all we do. Now, when Paul wrote this letter, and he wrote 13 letters all together, um, he was always sharing the message to the churches. The churches would then take this information and read it in their church, and then they would go to another city where Christians had gathered, and they would read it in that church. Those encyclical letters, so to speak, these traveling letters circulated throughout Asia Minor and throughout the known world as it continued to help people to grow in Christ. That went on for many, many years. What we're going to find today is, is that one letter was written that we have not read from before. It's not been found. And we'll find out about that in just a few moments. The key structure of all this is that Paul was wanting to teach the truth in love. We always, we all know that truth is so important. Uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and uh, no one comes into the Father but by me. We need to remember truth without love will destroy, and love without truth is shallow and empty. So truth and love, love and truth, they must go together always in the messages that we share. That was Paul's attempt in every letter he wrote. He was always writing truth in love, love and truth, so people would understand where his heart was coming from. Now, in this closing section, you have found the lesson was entitled Paul's Unsung Heroes. And here we find he mentions 10 individuals and three churches. We, uh, we need to ask the question, why would Paul mention these people? He could have just said, uh, I hear I'm signing my name at the bottom of this letter and uh, continue to pray for me uh, and, and just end the letter. But instead, he chose to mention these 10 individuals and these three churches. So why did he do that? My guess is if we were all together and I asked that question of the class, we probably could come up with 20 different answers or more because we would see different insights. I just want to mention two that came to me. The first is, Paul knew that he, he had started these churches, but he started them with people. And without those people responding to the message of Jesus Christ and being willing to be nurtured and grown in the spirit of Christ, they would have just left the church and gone somewhere else. They would have been just out in the world again but they chose to follow Christ and they became sort of like disciples of Paul, followers of Paul. As a result, the churches grew because Paul helped to start them. And of course, God provided the growth. 
But through the individual effort of all these people, the churches began to take hold and began to grow. Secondly, Paul knew uh, that just as he had been opposed in many places, so these people would be opposed as well. So he was given a word of thanks to them. He was recognizing them to encourage them to keep on doing the good work that God had given them to do. Paul, Paul knew full well what Jesus said to Peter. Uh, when Jesus said, I'll tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Did you hear that? I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Hell cannot stop the gospel of Jesus Christ when it's living, when we are living in the fullness of Christ every day. That's a wonderful word because we must always remember. While churches may go through tremendous fast, fast growth periods and do it super well, and then churches may wane at times, the church belongs to God. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church when God's people are faithful to Christ in all things. And so Paul was saying here in this letter, I'm giving thanks to those people fellow believers who risked their lives to help me and to share the good news. So who were these people? Well, open your Bibles, if you would, to Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. We find out who these people were. I'll begin reading there in verses 7 and 8. Tychicus will tell you all the things about me. He is beloved brother. He is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant of the Lord. I'm sending him, I'm sending Tychicus to you for the express, express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. You see, Tychicus had gone to Rome to see Paul in prison. He had given Paul a report of the church in Colossae. Paul then wrote this letter and he wanted Tychicus to take it back to, Col to Colossae, to, Col to the Colossian church, so they could read it and help them understand he knew their issues, their challenges, and that he was praying for them. He also wanted them to be informed about his present circumstances. You know how hearsay information goes, and a lot of hearsay information was going around about Paul, no doubt. He wanted a eyewitness to give the message to the church in Colossae about his experience in prison, his living conditions, his health, uh, how things were holding up. He also wanted Tychicus to encourage them not to be discouraged. He wanted them to know they needed to hang in there, trust God, he would help them, he would prevail. God was not going to be taken out by the Romans, nor by the Judaizers or any pagan gods. The God who revealed himself through Jesus Christ would always prevail. So he was giving them this very encouraging word. Now notice how he described Tychicus. He said, he is a beloved brother. He is a faithful minister. He's a fellow servant in the Lord. I don't know about you, but that's just about the highest praise anyone could give a friend, a beloved brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant. Let me ask you this question. What impact do you think would have on the Christians back in Colossae when they read this letter as, it, as Paul described Tychicus? A few years ago, a church looking at a person to be the pastor of their church and if they got a letter, say, from Billy Graham, and he described them as being a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord, how do you think that church would respond to that prospective pastor? They would say, we want this person because Billy Graham says he is one fantastic person, Christian, believer, follower of Christ. I believe that's the same kind of impact Paul wanted on the church at Colossae. He wanted them to understand 
he was completely behind Tychicus and what he would go back and teach them and how he would describe his own personal condition. He wanted Tychicus to serve that church and help them to fight against the false teachings of the, of the pagan, uh, the people who'd worship pagan gods uh, in that day and had now become Christians. So he was planting a seed in the minds and hearts of the Christians in Colossae that Tychicus was a very reliable source. Could I be so bold to say that they, that perhaps Paul was saying, you listen to him, you follow his leadership as if I was there providing the leadership. He gave him the highest regards. He gave him the highest letter of encouragement one could ever imagine. And then he went on to say this. He mentions Onesimus. He, he said in verse 8, he, Tychicus, is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother. Listen to those glowing words, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. In other words, he's from your area. They will tell you everything that is happening here. So he sort of underlined this word here about Onesimus, that he's going to tell you about what I've been experiencing and the people with me, as well as Tychicus is going to tell that information. But here's something that's interesting. To me, the very fact that Paul would mention Onesimus as a dear and faithful brother uh, was huge. Uh, if you have not ever read um, the book of Philemon, I would like to encourage you to read that this afternoon. It's a very short letter. In fact, it is a letter written to a person, like Titus is a book letter written to a person. Philemon was written to a person, not written to a church, although that le those letters circulated among the churches. Onesimus was a slave to Philemon. And while in prison, Onesimus was caught and he was put in a Roman prison. And when he was put in that Roman prison, who do you think was close by? The Apostle Paul. Can you imagine that good fortune for Onesimus? While there, Onesimus began to describe his past situation. He had been the slave of Philemon. He had run away. He had been arrested, put in prison. But Paul did not condemn him from running away, but rather he talked to him about his life as a person. And he helped Onesimus come to a faith relationship with Jesus Christ. He confessed his sins to God, and God had forgiven him. And Paul began to teach him the way of Christ, how to be a servant for Christ's sake. What's interesting, when you read the book of Philemon, the Apostle Paul uses a word, the word, he will be useful to you, which is the same very closely spelled word of Onesimus. In other words, he was telling Philemon that Onesimus is coming back to you to be useful to you. But then he wrote, I want you to receive him not as your slave. I want you to receive him as your brother in Jesus Christ. What an unbelievable thought for Philemon to be exposed to from the Apostle Paul. In a day when slavery was common, no one who owned a slave would ever think of their slave as being like a brother through any god, pagan god or otherwise. So Paul was crossing a lot of cultural barriers to help Philemon to begin to see Philemon, see Onesimus in a completely different way. He wanted Philemon to see Onesimus as God saw Onesimus, as a human being that God loved, for whom Jesus died on the cross. 
We need to always remember for the Apostle Paul, we're neither slave nor free, male nor female, barbarian, pagan, or whatever. We're all one in Jesus Christ. Nothing separates us from each other because we're all joined together in Christ. Paul had asked Philemon to welcome Onesimus back home, back home to be useful to him, to serve him, but not as a servant of his, but as a servant of Jesus Christ. What a powerful picture. And Paul had certainly taught Onesimus that he, the apostle Paul, was a servant of Christ. Christ was his master. He would not serve two masters. He'd only serve one. And that master would be Jesus Christ. It was a powerful moment in the church. Paul then continued in verse 10. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Well, now, who was Aristarchus? We find that Luke, the good doctor, mentions Aristarchus in Acts chapter 19 and in Acts 20. Back in the day when Paul was in the area of Macedonia, of Asia Minor, Aristarchus became a Christian, a Christ follower, and he was from Thessalonica. Rather than remaining at Thessalonica, he traveled with Paul to Ephesus. While there, you remember in reading the scriptures in Acts, a great riot broke out in the temple of Diana. Diana, rather. A mob captured both Paul and Aristarchus and Aristarchus and put them in prison. In Acts 19, 29, we read that later, when Paul was sent to Rome as a prisoner, Aristarchus sailed with him and stayed with him throughout Paul's imprisonment. That's why when he refers to him, he says, my fellow prisoner. Those were terms of endearment. Look at that again. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. So there was a, uh, there was a relationship that Paul had with Aristarchus that they had been prisoners together in Ephesus, now being sent, having gone to Rome together in a ship and put in prison in Rome, he was there serving the Apostle Paul. Now, we might ask ourselves, what is Mark doing there? Of all, of all those who were there with Paul, why was Mark with him? We have heard refer to him sometimes as John Mark, and that's where our dear beloved John Mark in our class has his name. We may find it surprised that John Mark was in that group. You remember that story when Paul and Barnabas left for their first missionary journey? Barnabas said to Paul, "Hey, I've got a cousin here. I like to I like to bring him along. Is that okay?" He said, "Sure. You can bring John Mark with you." And so John Mark apparently was a good writer. He was going to be their scribe, as record, recorded in Acts chapter thirteen, verse five. That was his task. They were going to teach and preach. Mark's job was to write down what was going on. But in the middle of the journey, you remember the story? What happened? Things got really difficult for John Mark. Maybe he got homesick. You know, maybe he got sort of chicken. He sort of began to say, I can't take the pressure. You know, I'm writing as fast as I can, but I don't like being out here with people who want to kill you. And so he went back home. Well, later, we find that when Paul and Barnabas were going to go on a second missionary journey, Barnabas said, hey, I want to bring Mark along with us. Paul said so strongly that it was clear to Barnabas, no, he's not coming with me. He was a quitter last time, and I don't want quitters to go with me and jeopardize our work. As a result, you remember what happened. Paul and Barnabas split up. Paul then got, he got Silas to go with him on that second missionary journey. And as a result, Paul and Barnabas never worked together again. Now listen, as a result, as a result of this, Mark was pushed away 
Barnabas still was his kin folks, and he loved him and cared for him. But two things happened. One, Mark's heart was changed toward Paul. I would imagine when he was told by Barnabas that Paul wouldn't let Mark let him travel with them on their missionary journey, I would imagine Mark got pretty mad about it, got really hurt, crushed. But you know what happened? God changed Mark's heart. He forgave him. He forgave Paul for not trusting him. And then he proved his devotion to Paul by going to Rome to help, help him share the good news of Jesus Christ. And the second thing we find here, Paul forgave Mark, an example of love and grace and forgiveness occurring in the fellowship of the church. Paul wrote these words, you have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. In other words, you've heard about him in the past as someone who is a quitter. Well, when, he come, when, when John Mark comes to you, when Mark comes to your place in Colossae, I want you to receive him. I want you to trust him. He's a person who really loves the Lord and is doing a good job. So then we find Epaphras. Epaphras is found in verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He's always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him, Paul wrote, that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Now, we learn in our earlier study, you remember in Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, we learned that, uh, that Epaphras was a very important part of the church in Colossae. He wrote about him there. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who told us of your love in the Spirit. Now, it's believed by many scholars that Epaphras was the overseer. That's a, that's a form of translation of the word that is used here. He's an overseer. He's like a pastor. He's sort of like a bishop. That's, all those words mean the same thing. In other words, he is the spiritual leader of the people in Colossae. It is believed by many scholars that he was the sort of like a traveling overseer, a traveling pastor, a traveling bishop. For in those early days, a person who was the overseer of any church would take care of two or three churches in the area. It is believed by most scholars that Epaphras was the pastor, teacher, leader, guide of the church in Colossae, the church in Laodicea, and the church in Hierapolis. All these three churches, you remember in our first study of this, early on in our class, we learned they all were within about 12 miles of each other. Colossae and, I mean, uh, Hierapolis and um, Laodicea were much closer. They're about six miles from each other. But Colossae was a little bit further to the east of these two churches. And so that pastor was traveling to these other churches, preaching, teaching, guiding them in their lives. He was sort of like what we'd call the old time circuit rider, preacher who traveled from church to church years ago here in America. So Paul wrote, listen to this, he is always wrestling in prayer. Have you ever heard that expression about anybody that you know? Have you ever wrestled in prayer for someone, for the church, for our country? Paul said he's always wrestling in prayer for you. Church Colossae and Heropolis and Laodicea, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. That's an interesting word, wrestling. Paul could have written, Epaphras is praying for you. And that would have been fine. That, that's a good word. He's praying for you. That would have been good, but, but he didn't say that. He used that word wrestling to express intensity fervently, power, passion. 
agony of heart. All those words are brought into this word wrestling. When you are wrestling with a thought, when you are wrestling with an idea, when you're wrestling with the will of God, when you're wrestling in prayer for people, it's, it's, it's not just a casual thing. It, there's spiritual agony, there's emotional agony, there's physical agony over what's going on here. In other words, have you, ha, ha, he was saying, he is putting out so much energy, Epaphras is putting out so much energy and prayer for you that he's hoping and praying that you remain faithful to God through Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say here, for the reason that you, the people in the Colossian church, may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Epaphras was praying earnestly in agony that they would always remain faithful to God, regardless of what the world might throw at them, regardless of what the what the people who had worshipped false gods had been coming to the church and become Christians and were teaching false things. He was saying, no, no, no. You keep on I'm agonizing over this. You remain faithful to God, no matter what others are saying out there in the world. In other words, he was saying, Epaphras is praying that you remain strong for Jesus. Strong for Jesus. Strong for Jesus. Paul then mentioned good Dr. Luke. Look at what he says in verse 14. Our dear friend, Luke, the doctor. Now, when did Paul come? I mean, when did Luke come on the scene? Well, we know that if you read the first 16 chapters of the book of Acts and the first and the first eight verses of the of chapter 16, you'll find that everything that the book of Acts, the way it's written is always in the third person. It's them and they. In other words, as as Luke wrote the book of Acts, he was writing from a hearsay perspective. He was not on the scene. So he was writing everything as them and they. Here's what they did. This is what brought back and forth. But then after verse, in verse 9 of uh, chapter 16, verse 9 and following all the way to the very end, he writes from the, from, the, uh, from the first person. It's I and we is the singular and plural. In other words, suddenly the words change. Now, we sometimes miss that when we read the book of Acts, but that's a critical juncture in the transcript in the, in the in the writing of the book of Acts by Luke. It shows in the first 16 verses, he was not involved, but in the six, in chapter 16 and following, Luke is very much involved in the in in the ministry of Paul and what's going on in the church. He's so he's writing from first person singular and so he says this in chapter acts uh verse nine luke wrote after paul had seen the vision we got ready we we got ready at once to leave for macedonia concluding that god had called us called us before it had been called them but it's called us to preach the gospel to them here's the point he went from them and they and we and us no doubt with paul's thorn in the flesh and we don't know what it was whatever it might have been it had to be a great blessing to have dr luke along with him to help him tend to his needs can you imagine what kind of lucrative career luke could have had had he stayed back in macedonia being a good doctor to the people there <clears throat> no he left it all he went with he went the Apostle Paul because he saw a need that Paul had in his physical life. He needed someone to help him physically to make it through all that he was facing. And Paul and Luke left his career to walk to walk with Paul. He was that dear, that wonderful dear friend. And then there was Demas. He says, and Demas sends greetings there's no praise and adoration or appreciation for demas here do you notice that in fact in second timothy chapter 4 verse 14 we read that while demas was mentioned he was mentioned as someone who had forsaken paul 
and because of the, his present love for the world. In other words, he's mentioned here in this letter, there's no great appreciation and adoration for him because later on we find in 2 Timothy, he was someone who loved the world more than loving Christ. He had forfeited his enthusiasm for Christ. He had failed in his faith and refused to be made whole to the person of Christ. Paul mentions him here as being with him, but he's way in the background. He's present. He's present physically, but he's not prayer. He's not present spiritually. Paul then mentioned Nymphia, Nympha rather, verse 15. Give my greetings to my brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. We must always remember the first century churches did not have grand buildings like we have, a small white buildings out on the highways of America. They didn't have buildings to worship in. They worshiped in the homes of people. We have to remember Aquila and Priscilla mentioned in Romans chapter 16, verse 5, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. They worshiped in people's homes. They taught what Paul had taught them. They communicated the gospel. And taking whatever Old Testament scriptures that they had in their hand, they would show through those Old Testament scriptures that Jesus Christ was truly the Son of God and the Messiah that God had sent. Finally, in verse 16, we find this. After this letter has been read to you, see that it's also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Here we find a great mystery. Whatever happened to the letter to the Laodiceans? Was it destroyed? Was it, it was definitely a letter that circulated among the churches in Hierapolis and back in Colossae. What happened to that letter? We don't know. But would you like to see a copy of it? I would love, I would wish some archeologists would find that in the urn just like they did those, those papyrus writings uh, in Quimron many, many years ago, back in 1948. Wouldn't that be great if that letter somehow turned up and could be proven to be an authentic letter from the Apostle Paul? It would tell us a lot of great things. Verse 17. Now, Crippus, uh, see to it that you complete the ministry you received in the Lord. Paul gave these specific instructions to Archippus. And uh, in other words, he was to continue doing what he'd been doing. He'd been faithful in everything. And it's so easy to get slack in our work when things become difficult and hard. And Paul was a, uh, encouraging Archippus to be faithful in the commitment he made. Just as Christ had died for him on the cross, so continue to be faithful in those teachings. God owes us nothing, but he has given us everything. God desires not to just head service, but God wants us to provide heart service. We serve, we go, we give because of our love for God. And then finally, in verse 18, Paul wrote, I, Paul, write this letter, this greeting, in my own hand. Remember my change. <clears throat> grace, grace be with you. As was his custom, Paul, being guided by God's Holy Spirit, would dictate a letter to a scribe. <clears throat> we have no proof of it, but I believe, just as Mark had been taken with Barnabas and Paul on their very first missionary journey, to be their scribe, I believe, I believe that Mark was there with Paul in this Roman jail to be the dictate, be the writer of what Paul was dictating to him. Very common practice. Someone would dictate a letter and allow them to think out loud and get the words right that they wanted to be written, and then a writer would write. I believe just as just as Peter dictated the gospel of Mark to Mark, and he wrote it down. I believe that it's very plausible that Paul dictated to Mark, and he was the one who actually wrote this letter. But Paul, by signing it himself, is showing he approved everything that was in it. It was his letter. It is, he, show, he shows this with his own signature, which was a wonderful way to do it. I like the words here, remember my change. You have to remember as he signed his name, as Paul signed his name, I wrote these final words, his chains around his wrist were chained to a Roman guard. And so as he wrote across the paper saying, this is my signature, remember my change, 
remember me. Grace be with you. His chains were rubbing across that letter. Can you imagine the impact that had upon the church in Colossae and all the other churches who read Paul's letter? How much he had sacrificed, how much he had given for the cause of Christ. What a great example, what a great model Paul gave to the early church to remain faithful no matter what you might face. God is always with you. God's grace is always there with you. God's grace is always enough. God's grace is sufficient. As we live our lives in these days and the days ahead, God's grace is always sufficient. Never forget that. Grace be with each of you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for Paul's tenacity. We thank you for his faith. We're grateful, Lord, that he had a heart for you that was so great. And we know, Lord, he, he looked at you and your heart for humanity and giving your life for us on the cross. And how else could Paul have behaved but to give his best? And we know, Lord, that you're calling us to give our best for our church, for lost people in the world, to give our very best. We, we dare not give less, to be willing to sacrifice whatever necessary to get the message out to people to learn about what you've done for us. May your peace and grace rest in your hearts and may it be such that we would wrestle with it every day to be excited about sharing the good news with everybody. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless y'all. See you next week. Now you can say. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Good lesson, Jim. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, David. That was really good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Don't forget, next week, uh, uh, Ken will be back, and he'll be teaching Faith Over Fear. It's a great, it's a great series of lessons, all that we've been through. Uh, mm -hmm. Faith always conquers fear. And Amen. He, our faith is in Jesus Christ, the greatest fear of conquering the world that's ever lived and will always live, outdo anything else. So keep trusting, never give up. And Love your books. Guys. Yeah, and your study books should be, some of you are going to receive, about 25 of you will receive your books in the mail tomorrow. So look for your study guide. Uh, if you don't get one, then let me know. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you, David. Y'all yeah. have a good day.